Thank you very much. We're a long way away from you. It's slightly hemmed in. Um, it is lovely to see you. We're going to dig into God's word together now. We'll come back and have uh, a bit of a long opportunity to worship together through song after that. And we're continuing this series called Blood, Boils, and Blessings, Finding Jesus in Leviticus, which if we were here last week, you'll know I'm very excited about. We're looking at this book we so easily think is old and odd and obscure, but actually we're finding it is hugely relevant to us. And it's relevant because it's answering a key question that all of us should care about and that matters to all of us, the question of how can imperfect people like you and I dwell and be in relationship with a perfect God? We found that last week, the fact that the Leviticus answers that question shows us something really important about the heart of God. And we saw the key message of this book is that God wants us. God longs and desires for you and I to find true life through intimate relationship with him. And we also found, if you're here, you remember we kind of talked about the story or Leviticus having a pyramid structure, a kind of story that's kind of represented by these icons we've got in the design. That it all works up to those two goats in the middle, the very middle of the book, the Day of Atonement, where God and humans dwell together. And we're currently on the bit working up to that point. We're going up the side of the pyramid, which answers the question, how can we get to that point? How can humans and God dwell together together? And today, we're going to look at a key part of the answer that Leviticus gives to that question in chapters 1 to 7 of the book, where it talks about sacrifices. I wonder if you've ever received a gift which really just wasn't quite what you wanted. Maybe it was a piece of clothing that didn't suit you or didn't fit yours, wasn't quite your kind of thing. Or maybe it's something else you just thought you didn't need it or you already had it or just, again, wasn't really your, quite a, your kind of thing. Maybe you got this gift and you thought, you know what I should have done? I should have made a gift list. I should have had a list of things that people knew, if you want to get me a good gift, here's the kind of things to actually get me. Well, Leviticus 1 to 7 are like God's gift list of what the Israelites can give to him. Because these sacrifices, all these offerings are exactly that. They're things they bring and offer to God and give to him as gifts. They're ways that they would worship God, ways that they would honor God. Usually it was some animals or some other food stuff, some grain or some oil or something, and they're presented as gifts to him. They give them up, they sacrifice them to give them to God. And I think we can kind of understand that today. The, the concept of gift giving as a way of showing honor and a way of showing respect still exists to some extent in our culture. Did you know that every year the queen receives a number of official gifts purely because she is the queen? They are gifts given to her to show honor, to respect her for who she is and for her position. In fact, back in 2019, she received 72 of these gifts, including a 24-carat gold-plated horse comb, a pop-up book celebrating the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China, and my personal favorite, a painting of a swimming pig. Now, I don't know the queen well. I, she may love swimming pigs, who knows? But I wonder if when she got that gift, she thought, I should have had a gift list. I should have told people what kind of gifts they can best use to honor me and show their the respect. She should have taken a leaf out of God's book because that's what God does in Leviticus 1 to 7. These are the gifts that people can bring to God to honor him and to worship him. And actually, through these chapters, there are five different gifts. Each of them have a different meaning, a different purpose. We could easily do a whole series just unpacking each one of those, but we're going to dive into one of them today. We're going to go to Leviticus 3 and talk about the peace offering, or sometimes it's called the fellowship offering. It's just different ways of translating the idea, and we're going to call it the fellowship offering, and that nicely encapsulates what it is. Because the fellowship offering is a very special offering. In many ways, it's like most of the other offerings and sacrifices. It involves killing an animal, doing some stuff with some blood, uh, burning some of it, the priest eating some of it. But this particular offering is unique and special because it was the only time when the Israelites themselves, the, the person bringing the offering, got to eat some of it themselves. So the priest has some of it, some of it gets burned, they get to eat some of it. What's going on is... God and the offerer, the worshiper, are sharing a meal together. God gets some through burning it, and the offerer gets some. They're sharing a meal together, and it becomes a meal about committing to God and about communing with God, which kind of means connecting in relationship. 
So we're going to read a little bit from Leviticus 3 and the kind of instructions given for this sacrifice. And like most of these sections of the book, you kind of basically get told for each type of sacrifice what to do depending on what animal you bring. And for a fellowship offering, you could bring something from the herd, that means a cow or a bull. You could bring something from the flock, that means a sheep, or you could bring a goat. And we're going to read about what you do if you bring a goat. So this is 3, verse 12. If his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and lay his hand on its head, and kill it in front of the tent of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then he shall offer from it, as his offering for a food offering to the Lord, the fat covering the entrails, and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys, with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, in all your dwelling places, that you eat neither fat nor blood. So you're in Israelite, you want to bring a fellowship offering to God, you've got your goat, what do you do? Well, you bring your goat along, and you start by putting your hand on its head. You kind of identify with it. You're saying, this goat is the goat that I am bringing. This is my offering. And you're kind of saying, this goat now represents me. What this goat goes through is representing me. And you're particularly putting all your imperfections, all your impurities, all your sin, your rebellion against God, you're kind of putting it onto the animal. And then you kill it. And notice that you, as the worshiper, kill it. The priests can't do it for you. You have to do it because this is your offering. This is your worship. And so you are the one who kills it. No one else can worship for you. But then the priests take over. And they take the animal. They take some of the blood of this goat. And they start sprinkling it or kind of chucking it across the altar. And this is where we kind of begin to think this looks quite odd. There's this big obsession with blood here. Every single one of these sacrifices, there's lots of stuff. What do you do with the blood? And you might even notice these verses said they're never to eat blood in the same way they're never to eat fat. And we might think this is just getting odd and obscure. What is the big deal with blood? Why make such a thing out of this? Well, it's because, as we're told a little bit later in this book, blood represents life. Leviticus 17, 11 tells us, for the life of a creature is in the blood. So when they're doing stuff with the blood of these sacrifices, it's representing the life of this animal. And in this case, the blood is to be thrown against the side of the altar. The altar was a, a kind of a raised platform covered in bronze, not dissimilar proportions to this, actually, which was the place where they took the stuff they were offering to God. It's the place where you burnt stuff to give it to God. And so the altar represents giving things to God. So you take the blood and you throw it against the altar, and what that is demonstrating is the life of the animal who has died is being given to God. The blood represents the life, putting it on the altar represents giving it to God. And this points us to a key purpose of these sacrifices. Not the only purpose, but a key purpose, which is making atonement. Bit of a fancy word, but atonement just means paying the price for sins. You see, they were conscious of their imperfections, their rebellion against God, their sin against him, which made them imperfect so they couldn't be in relationship with the perfect God. But actually making atonement dealt with that problem. And we'll get to talk about this much more in a couple of weeks' time when we talk about the day of atonement, but we can briefly unpack it here. You see, when the Israelites sinned against God, when they had impurity, they deserved death. The Bible was really clear, the wage of sin, what we all deserve for our rebellion against God, our rejection of him, is death. That's the just, fair, right, inevitable sentence we receive. And it's the reason why the mixing of the imperfect people and the perfect of God is so dangerous, because it results in death. But what happens in atonement is God sets a price, he sets a ransom price, so that people can be kind of bought back from death, can be rescued from that sentence of death, can receive forgiveness, can receive cleansing, can become perfect again to be in relationship with the perfect God. And the life of an animal is kind of the price that God set that they could give in order to buy back their lives, to pay a ransom price to rescue themselves. The animal acts as a substitute. The animal's life is given instead of, in place of, the life of the worshipper. And that's why blood on the altar is so very important. 
That verse in Leviticus 17 actually goes on. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I, God, have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. God's saying, you see, bring blood to me. Actually, that life gets given instead of yours. You get to receive forgiveness and cleansing. And notice what he says there. It's God who sets the price. God tells them what they need to bring. It's God who makes the opportunity for atonement to take place. God is the one who's given them the blood of these animals for this to take place, he says, which all means atonement is not earned. Atonement is a gift of God. This is God's loving, gracious provision so that people can be restored to relationship with himself. And partaking in the sacrifices is an act of faith, trusting in God's provision and God's promise to bring forgiveness and cleansing. And so atonement is about dealing with the sins that separate us from God so that forgiveness and cleansing can be received. And if you read through the sacrifices, you'll see it's central to several of them. What's interesting here in this sacrifice, the fellowship offering, is atonement is just like a foundation. It's a a base layer for so much more to be built on. The atonement then makes the way for both commitment and communion to take place. So the fellowship offering is partly about atonement, but it's also about a lot more. We should begin to see, after you deal with the blood, the priest then chops up the animal. The priests are basically the butchers of their day, and they take some of the fat Uh, the kidneys, a bit of the liver, and they burn it on the altar. And so you'd have this burning bit of meaty animal flesh and the smoke going up. And what's happening here is that stuff is being given to God. Burning stuff is a way of giving it to God because as the smoke goes up, it's a picture of this stuff being given to God. Now, obviously, the meat isn't actually going up the smoke. And obviously, God doesn't actually need food. These lights knew that, but this gave them a picture of the spiritual reality. The bits being burned are given to God. And they burn the fat, the kidney, the liver. And you might think, well, that's a bit odd. Why do they do those bits? Well, actually, it's because those were deemed to be the finest cuts, the best bits. You give God the very best bits. And that does seem weird to us because we have a very negative view of fat in our culture, understandably in some ways. But the Israelites considered it to be the best bit. It was the absolute delicacy. And so the very best is given to God, and he gets, as it were, his bits first. But then you might think, well, what happens to the rest? What happens to the rest of the cow or the sheep or the goat, whatever it is you're offering? And that's where this particular sacrifice is so very special. It's the only offering where you as the worshiper now get to partake by eating from it. Some of it gets burnt. Some of it's given to the priests because they need food, and that's where you're giving it to God as well. But then the rest of it, you get to eat. And it becomes this meal shared between you and God. Some's been given to God in burning, and now some you're going to enjoy in a meal. A few chapters later, Leviticus 7 gives us the kind of parameters, the directions for this. And it tells us to add bread to that. They're to have the meat, and they're also to add some bread alongside it. Because in ancient Israel, bread was a key part of almost every meal. It's telling them to make this into a meal, make it into a, a little feast. This sacrifice invites people to come and to have dinner with God, to enjoy a meal with him. And that's so important because meals were so important in that kind of context. In a way, they kind of still are today. Sharing a meal with someone still carries some level of significance in our context and our culture, but even more so back in ancient Israel. It was such a relational thing. Meals were often about committing. They were used to confirm covenants. Covenants are like binding relational agreements that establish a relationship together. And when you made a covenant, you then often share a meal together as a way of committing yourself to the agreement that you had made. Here, the Israelites commit themselves to the the covenant they've entered into with God, the relationship they've entered into with Him. This meal is about committing afresh to God. But also, it's a meal about communing. Because in the ancient world, in the same way it's kind of true to an extent today, meals were about building relationship, about connecting, communing, which just means kind of connecting in relationship. And in sharing the meal with God, the worshipper was communing with him, enjoying relationship with him, and actually communing with the rest of the community as well. Other people would come and join you in this meal. 
And so it's a bit like you might make him a business deal with someone. Maybe you decide to go into business, go and business partners with someone. You set out all the terms, you do all the paperwork, you sign it, you shake hands, and you might then choose to go out for a meal together. And that meal is a way of solidifying the commitment you just made to enter into business together. And it's a way just of beginning to develop and deepen and build the relationship that you have, and that's going to develop as you walk through that business relationship that you've created. In a little kind of way, the fellowship offering is a bit like that. It's sharing a meal with God, which is about committing afresh to him and communing, building relationship with him. And all of that is possible because you've done the stuff with the blood, which gives you this foundation of atonement so you then then commit to and commune with God. And notice, again, like we said last week, how this reveals the heart of God. These things that to us seem so odd are all revealing the gracious, loving heart of God. God could have just given the sacrifices to do the atonement bit. He could have just said, well, you can kind of have the forgiveness and the cleansing, you know, I'll be nice to you in that way, but then you're kind of off on your own. Then go and do what you want, kind of look after yourself, that's it, you've got enough for me. Because that was already far more than he had to do. There was no obligation for him to do that, no need for him to do that. But God doesn't just stop there. He doesn't say you can get forgiveness, but then off you go. He says, here's a way to find forgiveness, and now come and be in relationship with me. Come and commune with me. Come and eat with me. This is yet more proof from this book that God wants us. God's heart is orientated towards us in love and a desire for relationship with us. And what about us, though? What about us? Why don't we, therefore, make this offering? If it's so good, why don't we do it? And how does Jesus fit into all this? Because this series, remember, is about how does Jesus, or how do we find Jesus in Leviticus? Well, as with all of the sacrifices we find in Leviticus, Jesus does away with them because Jesus fulfills them. We've seen that a key part of this sacrifice, most of the sacrifices, was atonement. This thing of dealing with sins and imperfections that we can come back into relationship with the holy God. But what's striking if you read the Old Testament is the guys have to keep on doing this. Day after day, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, there's kind of a sense that it's not quite doing the job. It's not quite actually making them perfect to keep them secure in relationship with God which kind of makes sense because if you think about it, an animal can never be a fair and even substitute for a human. Their life in place of a human life, but actually that's not really a fair match. They're not a fitting substitute, and that's why Jesus comes. That's why Jesus fully takes on humanity, becomes a human like us, so he can be a fitting sacrifice, a human life for human lives. A sacrifice that wouldn't need to keep on being repeated, but can do the job once and full. And in fact, in the New Testament, this this gets picked up by the author of Hebrews. He talks about the contrast in the Old Testament sacrifices and Jesus' sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 11, And every priest, that's the Old Testament guys, stand daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Day by day, they're standing, they're doing their work, because actually it can never fully do the job. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Notice the contrast. The priests are standing up day after day. They're always doing their work. They can't sit down. They're too busy. They're doing their stuff. Jesus makes a sacrifice, and he sits down. That's really important. He sits down because the job is done because he's made for all time a single sacrifice that totally deals with sins. He sat down waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Jesus' death, the giving of his life, makes atonement. It pays the price in full so we can have lasting forgiveness and we can be perfected, Hebrew tells us. Remember, Leviticus is all about how can imperfect be people be with a perfect God. The ultimate answer is Jesus. Through him, we can be perfected for all time. So God sees us as pure and utterly perfect and able to be in lasting relationship with him. You see, Jesus kind of fulfills the Levitical sacrifices so we no longer need to make them. We no longer need to make sacrifices 
because Jesus has to become a once-for-all, one-time sacrifice for us. But if you remember, the fellowship offering was about atonement, but it wasn't just about atonement. There was another layer, there's more to come from it. It's also about this committing to God and communing with God. And that's also the true for us. The sacrifice of Jesus lays a foundation of atonement on the basis of which we get to have a relationship with him, committing and communion. What Jesus has done allows us to come into that. And we too, like the Israelites, have been given a ritual that allows us to commit and to commune with God. The fellowship offering, in that offering, the Israelites participated in the offering through eating sacrificial meat. Well, we've been given a ritual where we get to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ through eating bread, representing his body, and through drinking wine, representing his blood. The bread and wine, the meal that Jesus commands us to take, are kind of akin to the fellowship offering. They're an opportunity to participate in this sacrifice of Jesus and to commit to him and commune with him on the basis of atonement. Taking the bread and wine is about committing. We take them and we remind ourselves of the covenant that Jesus has made for us and that we have been welcomed into. Is there a chance to recommit ourselves to our role in that covenant, to our obedience to Jesus? To the fact that it's an exclusive thing, it's to him and him alone that we will be uh, obedient and we will kind of, as it were, swear allegiance. We are following him now. We're committing obedience to him as an outworking of the covenant commitment that we've made. And each time we take the bread and wine, it's a fresh opportunity to remind ourselves of that covenant, to commit ourselves to it again. But also, the bread and wine are about communion. That's why sometimes bread and wine is called communing. It's a meal of communing, uh, being in relationship together. Through it, we commune with God. We join with him, connect with him in relationship. Just as the Israelites shared the meal with God and connected with him relationally, so in our partaking the bread and wine, we connect with God. We connect in relationship. We get to kind of uh, participate or fellowship with him through partaking in the bread and in the wine. And actually, there's two parts to that. We're communing with Jesus, remembering his sacrifice, but also we're communing, we're connecting in relationship with each other. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians about the fact we eat from one, uh, one bread, i.e. the one body of Jesus, and that means we become united through this shared meal. The bread and wine is a corporate thing. It's uh, not a kind of a, a us, it's a us thing rather than a me thing. It's something we do rather than something I do because we are sharing this meal together, communing with Jesus and communing with each other. So you can see in a sense the bread and wine is in parallel to the fellowship offering. The fellowship offering uh, expands and deepens our understanding of what is going on. It's a meal that allows us to commit to God, to commune with God, all sitting on the basis of the atonement, the paying of the price, the forgiveness that Jesus has enacted through his death and his resurrection. If the band could head up at this point, please. And so we're going to have a chance this morning to do that, to recommit and commune with God through the bread and wine. Hopefully you've got a little bread and wine pot from when you came in. If you haven't, maybe stick your hand up and the stewards will look out for you and be able to bring you one if you want one. And this is a chance for us to commit and to recommit. It might be that actually you've committed to Jesus time and time again. Well, this is a time to come afresh and to give your heart to him. It might be you've never committed to Jesus, but you know today you want to do that. You want to enter into this relationship, become a follower of Jesus. Friend, you can take the bread and wine today as a very way of doing that. And if you do, do talk to someone you know or one of the guys on the front here at the end. We'd so love to tell you more about that commitment you've made. If you've not committed to Jesus, we'd ask you to stick this out, just because actually it's not going to mean anything to you. And this is a a meal about committing. It's deep and meaningful and purposeful. But don't feel uncomfortable about that. There'll be others doing the same, so it's no big deal. And why not come and chat to one of us at the end, find out more about what it means to commit to Jesus, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I thought the way we do this today is we're going to use some words to help us. You know, in the Old Testament, some of the Psalms are written to give words to help people as they engage in the sacrifices. The Psalms are there to help them to, uh, to engage in the meaning of these sacrifices. And in the same way, throughout church history, people have written really helpful words, prayers, and songs to help us to engage with the bread and wine. So we're going to use some of that this morning. 
Why don't we just stand as we begin to uh, engage with God in this way? Set our kind of minds on Him. We can stand together, we're going to pray, and then we're going to worship. And we're going to pray using some words that have been used in English churches for hundreds of years. And I'm going to read them, I'm going to pray them. But there are also some bits that say all of that in bold, that I invite you to pray with me, to partake as we do this together. And so we're going to pray together, and then the band will lead us in worship. And as we sing, we can take the bread, we can take the wine, we recommit ourselves, and we commune with God. Let's pray together. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. On the night that he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, Christ took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts. By faith, we thank you.